Welcome into the program. Great to be with you this morning. Thank you for deciding to make us a part of your day. You're listening to Tactics Radio, News Radio 1440, uh, exclusively on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Periscope. So I probably shouldn't say exclusively, but here we are. However you're listening to us, we always appreciate it. Thank you for being with us on this Thursday. Now, I know that because it's just the nature of the business, it's the nature of, of who I am, typically we don't get to do a lot of feel-good, fluff-piece news stories. And that's because we do want to bring you pertinent information. We want to be able to give you everything that you need to know because there's a lot of really important and unfortunately, most of the time it's bad stuff going on in the world. But this is one story that I am very pleased to bring to you because it is such a feel-good story. And it does revolve around one of, I think, the best businesses in America. Not saying the necessarily the most profitable or successful, even though they are both very profitable and successful. But I mean from a, a standpoint of just being a good company that people can kind of center around. And that, of course, is Chick-fil-A. So here in the state of Alabama, in Mobile, there was a Chick-fil-A that opened its doors on Sunday. Now, for just about everybody that knows anything about Chick-fil-A, that's unusual because they usually are closed on Sunday, which is something that I really respect them for because you know there would be an awful lot of church people that would go around to Chick-fil-A after church, after evening worship, morning worship, whatever, and Chick-fil-A would make a ton of money if they were to open up on Sundays and they just say, nope. It's not what we're about. We want to give our employees time off. They can spend that time resting. They can spend that time worshiping. Whatever they want to do, they can do. But the point is, we want to give all of our employees Sunday off. Nobody works on Sunday. You got to admire their conviction for that. They know that this would be a massive, massive profit windfall if they decided to open on Sundays. And they just say, no, we'd rather give Sundays off to our employees you got to respect their conviction for that. And so usually they are closed on Sunday, but this particular Sunday they decided to open up just for a little while, but they did open up for a couple of hours there in Mobile. And the reason that they did is because a 14 year old named Elijah Sparge, I believe is the way to pronounce his last name. This is a little boy who special needs. He has autism and it just so turns out that the thing that he has wanted to do his entire life, now why he wants to do this, I don't know. Kids have weird dreams. Kids have weird things that they want. When I was a little boy, I wanted to be the big fat yeast roll from Quincy's. And I'm, I promise I'm not making that up. You can ask my parents. When I was little, I mean about four or five, I wanted to be the big fat yeast roll on the Quincy's commercials. That was my goal in life. Uh, that quickly turned into me wanting to be Spider-Man, which was... I don't know, slightly less practical. I can't tell you how many spiders died me trying to microwave them so that I can get spidey powers. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so kids, you know, they, they have weird dreams when they're little. And, and this Elijah, uh, Elijah Sparge, 14 year old with autism, his dream was to work the drive through at Chick-fil-A. That's what he wanted to do. So, Hey, live your dreams, kid. I mean, more power to you if that's what you want to do. I wish that more people had appreciation in simple things in life. I, I wish that I had more appreciation for the simple things in life like that. But that's, that is what he wanted to do. He wanted to work that drive through at the Chick-fil-A for whatever reason. And because of that, the manager there at Chick-fil-A, and I do want to get his name right because I want to give, I love it when I'm able to give good people credit, a guy named Walt Gilstrap. He is the general manager of the, the Chick-fil-A there in Mobile, and I'm sure there's several in Mobile, but th this particular one. So he heard this. I don't know how. Maybe he overheard it from the family when they were eating at the restaurant, whatever. So he heard that this little boy, Elijah, that he really, really wanted to work the drive through at Chick-fil-A. Just so happens that his birthday is on a Sunday. And so for his birthday, as a gift to the family, this Chick-fil-A decided we're going to bring some employees up on Sunday. We're going to open the store up and we're going to let Elijah on his birthday because it is his birthday and this is what he wants to do. We're going to open up our doors and serve some customers. I mean, it's just a great feel good human story. It's a story of people helping 
other people. So what they did was they got together. They let Elijah run the drive through. They let him pass out orders. And they also gave him a big stack of cookies that he could give out free of charge to the customers going past there. So uh, just a, a good guy Chick-fil-A story. And Chick-fil-A is kind of known to do this. You can remember back in the snowpocalypse in Atlanta that they were opening up their doors to serve people there. Uh, when they had that big power outage in the Atlanta airport, the airport Chick-fil-A opened up. Uh, there were people that, that were helping out. Chick-fil-A's opened up during Hurricane Harvey, Harvey and gave free food out to them as well. And so Chick-fil-A kind of has, has a record of doing stuff like this. But for this little boy, they were able to really make his day. And I want to show you this particular post from the boy's mother. I believe it's his mother. I assume so because she has the last, the same last name. Could be an aunt, I guess. But uh, Renee uh, Sparge, she said, the way people love this kid amazes me. It has truly changed the way I live my life. Loving people with your whole heart, judgments aside, with no uh, anticipation of rewards. Thank you every single person that loves uh, Elijah. And so this is a picture of Elijah. You can see him there with the little crown on. He's the birthday boy. And they also had, if you'll look in that, that bottom left-hand corner, that he had a cookie cake with the words drive through King etched on it in frosting. So just a really good story to be able to see how this uh, one little boy, he had his day made by a handful of conscientious Chick-fil-A employees that said, you know, what? we're going to do this for this kid. Yeah, it's our day off. And yeah, we usually don't come in. But you know what? We'll, we'll do a little extra work. We'll show up and, and we'll just, you know, make this this little boy's birthday really special for him. And so good guy, Chick-fil-A. I do uh, really want to commend them for that. And of course, afterward, the cookie cake that you saw, they went inside the restaurant, had some Chick-fil-A and had a party for him in the restaurant after he was done working at the drive through there served about 40 customers. So Elijah had a very busy day. I'm sure he was very tired after that. So uh, just a great story uh, for Chick-fil-A and for this family that they were able to come together and make this little boy's day. So, you know, just want to give a little bit of, of credit to them for being able to do this. Now, I wish that all the stories could be about humans helping other humans like this one was. I wish that they were all big feel-good stories like this, but unfortunately they're not. It's not the world we live in, and we do have to get to some news that's a little bit more, uh, actually a lot more dire and a lot rougher on the conscience, but it's an important issue, and it's one that I believe we absolutely have to talk about, and that is the issue of life, which we'll be spending a lot of today's show on. So, well, I'll tell you what. Let's talk about the government shutdown. No, 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 not, not that government shutdown. I'm talking about the shutdown of the state of New York. Oh, you don't know about that one? Yeah, well, that's probably because the media has not given it a whole lot of news coverage. And so it's interesting to me to see wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the federal government shutdown. And New York shutdown, you're not even hearing about that. The reason that the New York shutdown is happening is because New York uh, Governor Cuomo, he is the older brother Andrew Cuomo, the older brother of Chris Cuomo, who has the primetime show on CNN. Yeah, no, no nepotism going on there. But anyway, uh, you've got the mayor of, of New or sorry, the governor of the state of New York saying that he refuses to sign a budget into law unless he gets something passed known as the Reproductive Health Act. Now, you might be saying, well, reproductive health, that sounds like a good thing, right? Well, here's what the Reproductive Health Act would actually do. It would allow for abortion for any reason at any time, including partial birth abortion. So currently on the books, there are restrictions for the state of New York for an abortion after a certain time. Now, there's still some of the most lax abortion laws in the country and, frankly, on this earth, because most countries have much stricter abortion laws and much, much more uh, restrictive measures on abortion than America does. We're one of only six countries that allows abortions after 25 weeks at the federal level. But even on the state level, I think 25 weeks is the cutoff point. And so what Andrew Cuomo has opted to do now is that he's saying, unless we get this thing passed through that basically allows you to get an abortion at any time for any reason, including partial birth abortion, in other words, you're in the labor room 
about to have a baby and you decide, nope, don't want it anymore. Go ahead, cut it open. You can do that in the state of Al- in the state of New York if this act goes through. And this is the big sticking point that Governor Cuomo is saying, nope, not going to sign a budget. We're shutting down the government if I don't get my way on this. Which, if you're doing a, a comparison and a contrast there, at least when it comes to Trump shutdown, and I won't even call it Trump shutdown because it, it's, as I've said, every shutdown, regardless of who instigates the shutdown, is always the fault of both parties. It takes two halves to shut down the government. But in the state of New York, even with a Democrat House and a Democrat Senate, overwhelmingly so, and a Democrat governor, he's saying that this is the issue that he is standing his ground on, and until this gets passed, he is not going to sign a budget into law. At least with the federal shutdown, the fight actually is over budget measures. The fight actually is on what we're going to spend money on. Governor Cuomo is saying, unless I get this other uh, unconnected legislation that I want through, I'm not going to fund the government. So you want to talk about, you're, you're not seeing the media go crazy and talk about how Governor Cuomo is taking the government hostage and trying to attribute it all at his feet. You're not seeing that like you are with Donald Trump. And the reason is because the cause that he is pushing for, in other words, unrestricted, unfettered abortion in every conceivable way, is a cause that they largely agree with. They don't like the wall. They think the wall's mean. Not that it would be ineffective. Not that it would be a waste of money. Primarily just they they think that it makes them not feel good. And so because of the feels and because they don't like the feelings that it drums up in them, they know that they're supposed to be against the border wall and against Trump. But when it comes to Governor Cuomo saying that he's going to shut down the government so that he will have the ability and people in his state will have the ability to murder children in the womb, that's a just cause that they're okay and they can get on board with. And so when Nancy Pelosi says the wall is immoral, which doesn't make any sense an inanimate object cannot be immoral, but the practice of slaying children in the womb, that's not immoral, and that is something worth shutting down the government for, apparently, based on the media coverage that we're getting on the state of New York. And here's what else it would do. Because you have to dig in to these laws and look at the intended consequences as well as some of the unintended consequences that one of the things this does is that it completely removes abortion in every way from the criminal code of the state of New York, which in their mind, well, abortion should be a crime, so we'll just remove it from the criminal code. Well, here's the reason why that's a really stupid idea. Even in New York that, like I said, has some of the most lax abortion laws on the books in the United States, there are laws in their criminal code that allow women to hold violent partners accountable for harming their unborn children. This would remove that. If you have a violent partner that somehow engages in an abortion, which, by the way, that is not unheard of. It's rare, but it's not unheard of. In fact, there was a case not too long ago, I believe in Virginia, where a woman sued because she wanted the baby, but the father of the baby slipped her abortion medication that caused her to lose the child. And they ruled that it was a homicide because you killed a child. You killed the baby growing inside this woman. If this is removed from the New York criminal code, then that person would walk away scot-free because he's not done anything to violate that. Because if abortion is no longer a part of the criminal code, then you're taking away a tool of women that even want their children and don't want an abortion if their partner does something to them to lose the child inside of them. Now, if they harmed the mother, they would also get assault and battery, but they certainly would not get murder once the abortion is removed from the criminal code. And so that's something that legally there is a protection for pregnant women and for their children that would be completely removed from the criminal code if this thing passes. Also, another thing that it would have an unintended consequence would be sex slaves who have the people that own them and control them go and get abortions, which, by the way, that happened not too long ago right here in Montgomery, Alabama, where there was a clinic that was an abortion mill, and they went straight to it, and they got an abortion, no questions asked, even though this girl was like, I think, 13 at the time that she got her most recent abortion. Yet, it turns out that guy was a sex trafficker, and he was using this girl 
in the child sex trade and the abortion mill, even though this per person wasn't her father, didn't ask any questions. As long as they got their money, they were fine with it. And so they performed two abortions on this same girl. And so, yes, it does happen. Sex traffickers know that they can get an abortion and then they can continue to use this child for sex. It is absolutely reprehensible that anybody would even consider removing abortion from the criminal code, considering this is one of the uses for it. I mean, it's just insanely wicked that people would even consider this. But this is the thing that Governor Cuomo has decided, I'm standing my ground here, no budget, no government, government will not reopen until I get my way on this. This is what Cuomo decided to take a stand on. And by the way, we should point out as well that when he made this announcement that this was going to happen, you know who was standing right behind him? New York's own Hillary Rodham Clinton that was supporting this move that would legalize all abortion, including partial birth abortion. And so you remember in that debate that she was having against Donald Trump where he talked about how Hillary was in favor of partial birth, birth abortion and she denied that she favored partial birth abortion? Yeah, well, showing her true colors here. And he gave, in very gruesome and surprisingly enough for him, accurate detail of what a partial birth abortion actually meant. And she outright denied it. No, I would never be in favor of that. And yet here she is on stage with Governor Andrew Cuomo supporting him and applauding him as he's saying that this is what I'm going to make my stand on. Partial birth abortion should be something that everybody's allowed to do. And so it turns out Donald Trump, 100% right on that. Not right on everything. Makes a lot of mistakes. Makes a lot of inaccurate statements. But he was right on that. Right on the money. And Hillary Rodham Clinton lying through her teeth saying that she was against it. And now when she's standing on stage with Governor Cuomo, oh, she's 100% for it. The woman changes her political ideology with the wind of the time. Basically, whatever room she's in determines what principles she holds. But there is just such a blatant double standard at play here. Because nobody in the media or in elected office is going after Cuomo like they were going after Trump because the people that it affects largely agree with Cuomo on this. And I'm talking about the elected officials in the media. In fact, if you're looking at some of the recent polling that has been done, and this is a poll that I don't even think is a whole month old, that they did on uh, recent findings on people and their stance on abortion. When you ask how many are pro-life and pro-choice, Pro-choice does outweigh pro-life by, I think, 55%. And those are the people that identify as pro-choice. But here's the thing. When you actually dig into the data and ask them specifics about what they believe when it comes to abortion, you actually see a very different story. Only about 30% of the people are in favor of abortion on demand, the way that Governor Cuomo is talking about. In fact, it's closer to 25%. And so that means roughly 75% of people are out of step with Governor Cuomo and his definition of abortion and the way that it should be. Because you've got people that agree with abortion, but it would only be allowed in instances of rape, incest, murder, that kind of thing. So we're dealing with roughly a little less than 2% of all abortions when you're limiting it to that. And that's a position I do not agree with, but I'm just saying that that is what the majority of people actually believe. And uh, the, the line above that is people that say that abortion should be illegal after 20 weeks. So first trimester, uh, for, well, more like, you know, first trimester is, is kind of, that's really the, the point that this particular survey was, was talking about. So instead of the, you know, the mark that I was just giving first trimester was the way that this particular survey worded it. So people that are saying after the first trimester, no abortions. The overwhelming majority, we're talking in the 70s percent of people, believe that this would be wrong, that this would be immoral, that Governor Andrew Cuomo's stance on this is a radical departure from what most people would consider moral practices when it comes to abortion. And like I said, I don't even necessarily agree with the majority on this. I'm just saying that, that is their position, that he's out of step even with a lot of the people that believe that they are pro-choice and say that they are pro-choice.
So it, it really is just a huge double standard here. And by the way, I'd like to point this out too. Despite the fact that this law would be taking away tools that women use to protect themselves legally when it comes to violent partners that would harm them or harm their unborn children, and it would take away the ability of sex slaves to be able to, to call out legally the people that are abusing them, they would still be caught for, for sex trafficking, sure. But the abortions that they force them to undergo, those would no longer be criminal offenses if this thing were to pass. And you never hear anybody say that Governor Cuomo hates women or is anti-woman. You never hear him say that. In fact, there are a lot of people that are praising him and saying that this is what women want, even though that's not true. That are saying that this is something that most women would support, even though the polling that we just showed would, would say that that's not true at all. There are a lot of people that are saying that he's a champion of women's rights, and yet he would do this to women that are caught up in sex trafficking and women that are being abused by their partners and having their babies taken from them in utero by violent partners. And nobody's talking about Governor Cuomo's war on women. And another thing, too, in the city of New York, New York City, this is a statistic that I think came out about two years ago and it still holds true today. Statistically, if you are black, you are more likely to be aborted in the womb than you are to be born. So out of all the black pregnancies they have in New York City, more are aborted than actually go through and give birth, which is a tragedy on genocidal levels. But nobody calls out Governor Cuomo and says, maybe he doesn't like black people. There is a complete double standard here. And here's the thing that I would like to point out. People have, because I live in Montgomery and I say things that are sometimes unpopular, I've been called a racist probably more than the average person. Uh, I'm called a racist more in one week than most people are called in their entire life. And so it's just, it's part of the job. I accept it. I understand it. But I want to ask you this question. In Caleb Cockwood's world, if he were running things, there would be millions upon millions upon millions more black citizens in the United States of America because I oppose abortion. Under my worldview, you would have millions of American citizens. Black people would be a much larger part of the voting populace and the population. And I'm fine with that. And Governor Cuomo is supporting a system that would not only, is currently aborting more black children than are being born, but he's wanting to further the system and make it available to where more black children can be killed in the womb. And somehow, this guy is a champion of minority rights, and I'm the racist. How does that make any sense in anybody's universe? That's really the question that I want to leave you with, because the media has shown an obvious, obvious bias to favor Cuomo because they like the policy that he's trying to push because they too are far left-leaning radicals. But they also seem to care far more about illegal immigrants than they do American children because they're far more worried about hurting the feelings of illegal immigrants by putting up a wall than they are actually doing something that would save the lives of American children and keeping their murder, uh, their, their mothers from murdering them in the womb because they're freaking out about the, the shutdown on the federal level. But the New York shutdown is quas uh, sort of passed quietly in the night. They don't really want to talk about that one. And so it does show a obvious double standard here. That they're so worried about even hurting the feelings of illegal immigrants. And yet, they seem to not care whatsoever about the children that are aborted. Nancy Pelosi can go on national TV and say that the wall is an immorality. But the 60 million children that have been killed in this country since Roe v. Wade, that's not immoral. Even though she's a Catholic and can say that it absolutely it, it just blows my mind the level of sheer inconsistency and they don't even see it but anyway 
unfortunately, New York is not the only state that engages in this in this kind of debauchery, not to be outdone by its fellow blue state. California is back in the news when it comes to the issue of life. A California judge has issued a rule that blocks a new rule from the White House that would protect citizens from being forced to pay for drugs and devices that cause abortion. So the way that this particular one worked, the way that this particular law or sorry, this particular rule that was handed down by the White House would work is it was basically saying that we're not going to pursue we're not going to pursue people that are not in compliance with the Obamacare mandate, even though I still think it's weird that they're even doing this because you have to also keep in mind that the Little Sisters of the Poor made essentially the same argument and they won their Supreme Court case. So I'm a little confused on why this is even still an issue. Maybe there's somebody that's an attorney that's w- more well-versed in this stuff than I am that will call in 860-1440 and, and will be able to explain why this is even an issue or how this even came up in court after SCOTUS already ruled on it once and ruled in the favor of the Little Sisters of the Poor in favor of the Christians. Uh, and I believe so on, on Hobby Lobby as well, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe those were circuit court opinions and it only affects a certain circuit. I don't really know. But anyway... The reason that I bring that up and and I say all that to say that the California judge has issued this new rule that would remove those protections. So Christians, presumably, that disagree with abortion would now, under this particular ruling, if it, it were to go into effect, that they would have to pay for abortion pills or abortion devices and cover it through insurance. So if you're a Christian and you own a business and you provide health care, you're no longer allowed to say, oh, okay, I'll pay for their health care, but I'm not going to pay for their abortion contraceptives. First of all, I don't understand why insurance would cover contraceptives anyway when you're talking about a health care plan, because it is an elective thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand that birth control does certain things that aren't even necessarily related to birth. For example, for some women, it helps clear up their skin, regulate their hormones. I get that it does that. But I'm just talking about it's still an elective thing. Nobody's going to die or get sick if you don't have birth control. Or if that were the case, you would think that your doctor would need to prescribe it to you in a different way. But when it comes to this, the insurance ought not have to pay for abortion medication. We're talking about the Plan B pill that terminates a pregnancy after the embryo has already been fertilized. And so if you believe that life begins at conception, then you believe that the plan B pill snuffs out that life, that that life is ended by this medication. And so what this judge in California is saying is, nope, you, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you believe in it or not, you have to pay for another person's abortion. It's just absolutely horrific the way this country has gone mad with their dedication to killing children. So as bad as this decision is, and it is, I think what's actually worse is the rationale behind it because the verdict of course matters, but how you get to that verdict also matters, especially when you're talking about the law. So this is an excerpt from a, a a article I read on life news, California attorney general, Uh, Attorney General Xavier Becerra argued in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California that a regulation issued by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services would prevent an insufficient number of California women from conceiving and giving birth to children. In California's view, he argued, the problem is not that the federal government under Obama's regulation was forcing Christians to act against their faith and actions resulted in the destruction of innocent life. The problem is that under President Trump's regulation, more babies might be conceived and born in California, and thus the state would be forced to pay for them. All right, first of all, well, maybe this is a reason that you don't have a massive welfare state like you do in the state of California. Maybe this is part of the reason that you don't offer free crap to people when they have children because... If you're incentivizing births, especially births out of wedlock, you shouldn't be surprised when you subsidize that, that more people jump onto that system. And so if you really want to limit 
the people that you are forced to pay for based on your own laws, the solution to that is cutting back the welfare state, not killing more children. Anyway, he continues on, and this is A.G. Becerra in his own words. In California, 48% of all pregnancies were unintended in 2010. Of those unplanned pregnancies that resulted in births, 64.3% were publicly funded, costing California $689.3 million in unintended pregnancies. So his logic here is the reason we have to force Christians to pay for abortion pills and abortion devices against their will is that babies are just too darn expensive for the state of California. That the state has to pay for so many of them, and because of that, we've got to kill more children. Well, if that's the logic that we're using, why don't we just off everybody in an orphanage? Seriously. If that is your reason, you're saying, look, they're just too darn expensive, we can't afford them, so because of that, you know what we need to do? We need to put all the orphans in our state in gas chambers, because it's costing the state just an awful lot of money to keep them afloat. And by the way, you know how we'll actually fund that? We'll get the local church to sponsor the gas chamber we're putting these orphans into and gassing them to death. You've got to be outside your ever-loving mind. How did the AG of California come to this conclusion that the reason that we need to be able to force Christians into purchasing abortion products that they do not agree with, whether or not you even think abortion should be legal, is actually a separate issue from whether or not you believe Christians ought to pay for a practice they believe is morally reprehensible. But even so, he's saying the reason that we need to have that happen is because we're just having too many unintended pregnancies out there, which again, they have access to abortion or sorry, they have access to abortion on a large scale in California and it's not stopping the unintended pregnancy. So obviously you're not really doing even your own argument as weird and twisted and evil as it is, is still not giving you the results that you want to in this. But your rationale for forcing Christians to even if you don't necessarily agree with their stance on this, which of course I do, to force them to engage in something that at least they view as murder is, well, it's just costing the state too much money. Isn't it amazing how liberals seem to only care about finances and only care about how much money is being spent when it fits one of their policies? The only reason that they become fiscal conservatives, whether you're talking about the shutdown right now, whether you're talking about uh, when it comes to abortion, the only time that they even seem aware that the government is spending too much money is when doing so or the, trying to decrease it would be by supporting one of their policies. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And here's another thing, too. When they defunded Planned Parenthood in Texas, when they got rid of that, you know what happened to the state? Not only did abortions drop by over 4%, but unintended pregnancies also dropped by 4%. See, that was the opposite of what all the liberals in the state were crying about when they decided to defund it. They said that what's going to happen is you're going to see uh, teen uh, single births and, and teen births skyrocket because they have nowhere to go get an abortion. No, actually the opposite happened. You just had less people getting pregnant when you no longer had that giveaway of saying, oh yeah, go out, have as much sex as you want. We'll pay for your abortion. See, it turns out once you actually hold people responsible for their actions, they tend to be a little bit more cautious in taking those actions. Now, it didn't solve the problem. There's still unintended births in Texas and there's still people getting abortions in Texas and I understand that. But what I'm saying is when the government said, okay, you can do it if you want to, we're not going to fund it, we're not going to bankroll you in that, then all of a sudden people started actually acting more responsibly. And so it turns out that doing that actually decreased the money that the state was spending on that, both on the end of not paying for the, uh, the services offered by Planned Parenthood and also on the other side of the equation, they saved money on that side too, because there were less wards of the state, there were less unintended pregnancies that the state and federal government had to help support. And so actually, even if you 
took the moral equation out of it and didn't care that abortion was immoral and evil, even if you took that part out of it, the attorney general's argument still doesn't make any sense because we've seen states that cut back on funding for abortions actually see less abortions and less unintended pregnancies happening. So even if you were looking at it as a purely economic equation and ignoring the morality altogether, it's still the more economic decision to not fund this massive welfare state and to fund abortions. So he, even using his own logic, it doesn't pan out. But the thing is, this is really the result of communist Marxist thinking. That's all it is. And the reason that I say that and bring that up is because if you understand what's known as the complete live system, if you understand the basis of Marxism being that you are only useful as a collective, then you understand how in his mind this actually does make sense. Because if you look at people as nothing more than a cog in a machine and you only have value in what you contribute to society or contribute to the masses, in other words, you as an individual don't actually have any significance, but you as a part of society, as a part of the government, as a taxpayer, you have value because of what you're contributing to society, then this actually does make sense. That guy is eating way more potatoes than he's growing, so we got to off him. I mean, this goes back to the very early days of Marxism. George Bernard Shaw, the Fabian Society, one of the earliest, I would think actually Europe's oldest, Marxist society, one of the things that he said, and we have a recording of him saying this, is that occasionally people should have to go before a board and say, sir or madam, justify your existence to us. And then if they cannot justify their existence, in other words, they can't say, look, I'm producing more potatoes than I grow. I'm contributing to society in this way. Then we have to have a method to kill them. This is where the idea of a gas chamber actually came from originally. George Bernard Shaw saying that we should figure out a way to humanely put them down in mass, those that aren't contributing more to society than they're taking, those that can't justify their existence to a board of bureaucrats. And this is the kind of thinking that is leading to the Attorney General of California saying, look, we got to kill these kids. They're just too darn expensive to keep alive. Even though that's actually not true, you still have this line of thinking to where you are not important human life is not intrinsically valuable unless it is contributing to society as a whole you're not important as an individual you're only important as what you can contribute to the masses it's a horrific way to look at humanity and it has led to some of the greatest human tragedies and mass genocide in human history everywhere from nazism to communism to mao's china I mean, just horrible human atrocities. But this is the same line of thinking that is being used in California to justify doing this. And if you know anything about the complete live system that one of the Obama architects, Ezekiel Emanuel, designed, this is exactly what he was talking about when he said we need to ration gov government health care. Because he, he, he said that his goal was a single-payer system that revolved around the complete live system. And what the complete live system is, and you can look all this up, double check me, do your own homework, is he's basically saying that you have to make an evaluation of how valuable that person is going to be to society. So for example, a young person that is in his 20, 20s, 30s, something like that, and still has several years to pay into the system and to produce and to make more money, that person is going to get care before and give, be given priority before Older people that have already, quote unquote, lived their life or lived a complete life, according to him. And the same would be said of babies that it will take several years before they are able to contribute to society because they're children. I mean, it is a horrific, it look, it reads like you pulled it right out of a dystopian novel. Some of the things that Ezekiel Emanuel has said, and this is one of the guys that helped craft Obamacare. But it's the same line of thinking that we're seeing here, that people are only valuable based on the contributions that they can make to society. You see, to the central planners, you're just a cow in a pasture. That's all you are. You're not an individual. You're not a thinking individual. You're not a human being. You're not a rational adult that is allowed to make his own decisions. You're just a cow. And every April 15th, they got to come out and milk you. They got to come out and see what you're doing 
to contribute to society, they got to get those taxes from you. Really, that's the only value you have to them. Because to the central planner, you're just a number, just a piece of livestock. You're not an individual. And so because of that, you are only valuable based on what you can contribute. And just like a farmer who goes out amongst his dairy herd and sees one cow that just isn't producing year after year, you're just, sorry, you're just a piece of livestock to them. You get turned into hamburger meat. That's what happens to you. If you're not putting out the amount of milk that they see or the amount of tax dollars in this case that they see as being sufficient, then they believe that they have the right to deny you health care and just let you go ahead and die. Again, it is a horrific, ghoulish way to look at humanity, to just devalue human life to basically only being worth something if you're worth something to the collective. But it really is how they think. And the governor, sorry, the attorney general of the state of California has just proven that by saying that the reason we need to force people to be able to pay for abortions, even if they don't believe in abortion themselves, is because we need to kill more children. We need less babies to be born because it's just too expensive to keep them alive. And I hate to say that, but that is the line of thinking that we're seeing crop up even right here in the United States of America. And in the words of Thomas Jefferson, I tremble for my country when I remember that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. But we're going to go ahead and do a breaking the internet. I didn't touch anything, I swear. Oh, Ty, what did you do? It wasn't my fault. All right, so today's breaking the internet, we are going to go to a tweet that uh, I saw just the other day. And uh, Ben Shapiro talked about this. Glenn Beck also talked about it. It got uh, jumped on by a whole bunch of people. So <clears throat> this person, Daniel Kampfer, whatever. Anyway, dear SCOTUS, fetal tissue is not a person. And you see that it's repeated there about five times. But I am, and I matter more than fetal tissue, signed people who have miscarriages and abortions. All right, so a uh, there's a, several problems with this tweet, uh, but, but I'm going to go through them. First of all, regardless of what the issue is, even if it's an issue that I agree with, which of course on this one I vehemently oppose, repeating something over and over again doesn't make it true. Doesn't make it true. I'm sorry. I know that that probably hurts your feelings, but just because you say something 10,000 times doesn't make it true. And so you can repeat this often as you want to, but it still doesn't make you right. And I would be saying that if she said something I agreed with. If, if for example, she said that uh, uh, abortion is murder, abortion is murder, abortion is murder, abortion is murder, I still would say, even though I agree with what she's saying, that repeating it over and over again doesn't make it true. You have to prove it scientifically if you're going to make a claim scientifically philosophically whichever proof that you want to use you got to use something other than just saying it over and over again because i can say things that are untrue and just repeat them over and over again it doesn't do anything to the merit of the argument itself i will say this though at least she didn't use the stupid clappy hands emoji which i usually see when people repeat things over and over again it's just sad when people do that because you're essentially applauding your own point it would be like if in a conversation I made a point and then applauded myself afterward and talked about how brilliant it was. Look, that's just pathetic. It, seriously, if you want someone to take you seriously, don't use the stupid clappy hands emoji. That's just a personal pet peeve of mine. But it, it's like laughing at your own joke or patting yourself on the back for an argument that you made and doing it right in front of everybody. You can think that it's good if you want to, but you really shouldn't applaud yourself. It's like liking your own post or something like that. So the same thing is true in talk radio as well. And I say this to some callers that think that if they just say the same thing over and over again, or if they say exactly the same thing and reword it, that somehow that strengthens their argument. And I keep trying to tell them that they don't. You're entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to make whatever crazy claim, true or false, that you want. But I'm going to call you out on it and ask you to back it up. And you saying the same thing over again doesn't make you right. You have to actually prove it when you make a claim like that. 
So the second part of this is that individuals cannot sign things for groups and pretend that the groups are just homogenous. So th you'll see at the end of that tweet, what she did was she signed it by saying people that have abortions and miscarriages, except this is not the idea of every bar every person that's ever had an abortion or a miscarriage. I'm not going to talk about who it is because it's a deeply personal and, and frankly, incredibly harmful thing to the psyche of a woman that her body was, you know, went through that process of getting pregnant and did not carry the baby to term. And so I'm not in any way going to talk about who this is or, or who I know that has done this. But suffice it to say that I know several women that I'm very close to that have had the horrific experience of a miscarriage. And with the exception of one, and I don't really know where she stands on this just because we've never talked about it, so she may be pro-life, I'm really not sure. Um, with the exception of one, every single person I know that has had a miscarriage is pro-life. All of them. Now again, there may be some women that are pro-choice that I just don't know that they've had a miscarriage. And there is that one that I just really, really, really don't know where she stands on the issue, but I happen to know that she had a miscarriage. But other than that one, all the women that I know that have experienced miscarriages, all of them, all pro-life. And again, that's anecdotal evidence, but it's still better than just assuming that every single person that's ever had a miscarriage is in favor of abortion and does not view the child that was growing within them as a baby. And when you go to abortion, you know what? Even though most of the women that have had abortion are pro-choice, there's a growing contingency of women that believe that they made a mistake and what they did was wrong. And I know a woman personally that went through an abortion and regrets it to this day, thinks it's the biggest mistake she's ever made, and is staunchly pro-life. And so you can't just assume and sign something off and try to convey to the people that you're talking to that every single person that fits into this category agrees with you. It's bad rhetoric and it's, un it's uncharacteristically false. You're characterizing people that you don't know and cannot speak for the entire group. For example, you'll never hear me say all Christians believe this because all I may, might say all Christians in the biblical sense believe this because they would have to conform to the Bible. And the Bible says this, ergo, this is what a real Christian would believe. But you'll never hear me say that the entire Christian community or everybody that goes to church on Sunday believes this way because I don't know that. I don't know that, and I don't make those wild outlandish claims to try to prove a point. And even if I did, agreement in a community does not make something right. So just because you happen to have a community of agreement, again, this woman doesn't, but even if she did, that still would not make her point right. And so finally, here's the big one. You're made of tissue too. So you can say that fetal tissue is not a person like I said, 10,000 times if you want to, but you're kind of ignoring the fact that you're made out of tissue. You are made out of tissue. In fact, dictionary.com, the definition of tissue, biology, an aggregate of similar cells and cell products forming a definite kind of structural material with a specific function in a multicellular organism. Now, do you see any distinction in that between fetal tissue and the tissue of an adult? No, because there's not one. Biologically speaking, there is no difference in the tissue that makes up the human body of an unborn child and the tissue that makes up me and you and everybody else within the sound of my voice. Biologically speaking, it is, as the dictionary said, an aggregate of cells that, you know, serve a particular purpose. And so that could be true. You could say over and over again, adult tissue is not a person. It still doesn't change the fact that it's a person. And it doesn't change the fact that the person making the argument is also made of tissue. And there is no medical distinction between fetal tissue and the tissue of an adult person. Tissue is tissue. Now, the cells making up the child are a little bit younger and they have a little bit different qualities. But the fact is it's still tissue. And speaking from a medical standpoint, and it's hilarious to me that we're often called the science deniers, that the right is always characterized as the people that are anti-science and don't know biology. There is no biological distinction between the tissue that makes up an unborn child 
and the tissue that makes up a child that has just been born. It's the same tissue. It doesn't change. And there's no medical distinction between those two. Because you're not talking about lizard tissue. You're not talking about giraffe tissue. You're not talking about fish tissue. You're talking about tissue that is made up of cells. And what does the DNA inside every single one of those cells say? If anybody were to dig this, you know, obviously it would have to be fossilized, but you actually can get DNA from fossils depending on how they're preserved. If you were a thousand years from now to take a cell out of a baby's body, a baby that has not been born yet, and a scientist were to observe it, they would say, oh, that's human DNA. That would be a human being. The DNA doesn't change. Ergo, the cells are the same. Ergo, the tissue is the same. That is human tissue. And by the way, when we're talking about DNA that is contained within those cells, well, whose DNA is it? Is it the mom's DNA? No. Is it the dad's DNA? No. It is a unique genetic signature. It is a combination of the DNA of the mother and the father. This is basic sixth grade biology. I don't understand why they have such a hard time with this. So if you've got a completely unique genetic signature contained within the cells, and those cells are human being, you have human DNA inside those cells, and those cells make up tissue, then how can you make a distinction and say that quote-unquote fetal tissue is not a person and not also say that adult tissue is not a person or teenage tissue is not a person or old person tissue, however you want to characterize it, is not a person. The tissue is the same regardless of who it is. Uh, it looks like we have somebody on the phone, so we're going to go ahead and look at that. Uh, let's go to John. Is it John from Millbrook, is that you? Hello? Hello? Oh, there you are. Yeah, we've got you. I thought that was you. Go yes, ahead. I, uh, it, when you start trying to justify different areas of this, that's where you fall into problems. Mm -hmm. um, because you're you're not going to be able to be consistent with you see what I'm saying because the science is going to make you inconsistent because you're doing something wrong does that make sense yeah well the science itself is inconsistent when you're talking about being pro-choice and that's the problem it's not that they can't make the argument it's that the argument itself is bad yeah and the more we learn and the greater as, as time goes on and the more knowledge we have and what's happened and transpired with this, we know so much more now than when Roe v. Wade was passed that uh, the as time goes on, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. uh, we know how much more of a human being that is inside. And uh, the science is the friend in this thing, really. Oh, absolutely. Getting harder, getting harder to refute that, too. In fact, just this past year in 2018... They were able to do scans on a baby's brain in utero, which we didn't have the technology to do before because you're, you're basically trying to go through two different bodies, first the mother and, and then the child. But they were able to detect brain activity very early in these children. And so mm -hmm. the, the better the science gets, the more we learn. Actually, the more that we learn that we're more similar to people in the womb uh, as adults than we ever previously believed, even that... Uh, more so than pro-life advocates believed. Yeah. As, are the percentages still g going up on those that are against abortion? Yes. Uh, actually, if you're looking at the trend, that has been true since about 1992, I believe, is the year that that trend started, that approval for abortion on the whole, if you're looking at the entire population, has been trending downward. It's still not where it needs to be. Most of the polls that you're looking at will have people that are pro-life listed in the, you know, barely above majority, so like 51, 52 percent. But, I mean, it's it's been trending that way since the 90s, and I think eventually we're going to get to the point where there are very few people that approve of abortion. I would love to know where those polling people come from. Because okay. if you, you took the poll in the Northeast, it would be a lot different than it would in the Deep South. Probably so, but you know, when they try to take these public opinion polls where they're talking about Americans in general, they try to pull it as make it as random as possible so that they're pulling from lots of different places. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. And yeah, appreciate your call. Topic. Yeah. Have a good one. So we appreciate it as always. And that's the thing. If you're looking at this definition, 
and this is what he was talking about with the science being inconsistent, an aggregate of similar cells and cell products forming a definite kind of structural material with a specific function in a multicellular organism. Well, if we've already determined that the cells are human, and those human cells do not belong to the mother or the father, then how can we assert that it is not a person in any way? Those are the cells that make up the tissue, and the tissue makes up what? An organism. Well, it's not a cactus. It's human DNA. So how can you assert that that is not a person? It's formed an organism, which, by the way, is life. And so how can we assert that what is going on inside the, the mother's womb inside there with her baby. How can we assert that that is not life? It's a completely unique genetic signature. And if you're looking at the definition of tissue, which is the sticking point with this, with this lady, that if you're looking at the definition of tissue by the medical definition of it, that would constitute a person. You cannot bring up a definition of personhood from a physical medical standpoint that applies to an adult that would not also apply to an unborn child. Any line that you draw, unless the line is at conception, is scientifically inconsistent. And that's the reason that you have this. And another thing, too, that happened just this past week, another event that happened on Twitter. It's amazing how much news happens on Twitter now. Lena Wynn, uh, sorry, Leanna Wynn, she is the new president of Planned Parenthood. So Cecile Richards, one of the worst human beings that's ever lived, I'm convinced. But Cecile Richards, who was the former head of Planned Parenthood, the one that brought us shout your abortion and talk about how proud you are of it, she eventually retired. And she retired just this past year. Her replacement, Leanna Wynn, has tweeted out about this. So just so you understand the context of, of all this, Leanna Wynn did a series of interviews with BuzzFeed when she took the job and Cecile Richards left. And in those particular interviews that she did, because BuzzFeed, you know, they edit it, they, they put the pieces together. Basically what they did was they emphasized that Planned Parenthood offers all these other healthcare services other than abortion. And they emphasized that and brought that forward, which politically was the smart thing to do from BuzzFeed's perspective. But Leanna Wynn saw this, and she basically tweeted out that she was disappointed in the way that this whole thing uh, played out. So we'll go ahead and, and look at that. This is Leanna Wynn, the president of Planned Parenthood, the new president of Planned Parenthood, who said, I'm always happy to do interviews, but these headlines completely misconstrue my vision for Planned Parenthood. If you can see the headline down there, it talks about Planned Parenthood's new president wants to focus on non-abortion services. So she's saying that that is a misconstruing of her vision for Planned Parenthood. Okay, so for those of you who are paying attention, yes, that would imply that her vision for Planned Parenthood would be the abortion services. But unless you're a little bit foggy on that, Leanna Wynn explains herself in the very next tweet. First, our core mission is providing, protecting, and expanding access to abortion and reproductive health care. We will never back down from that fight. It's a fundamental human right, and women's lives are at stake. Well, there you have it. The president, the head person over Planned Parenthood, says that not only do they offer abortion, but abortion is our core mission. Now, this is what conservatives have been saying basically since the existence of Planned Parenthood that they are an abortion mill, that that is what they do, that is their focus, and there is no reason that even if you want abortion legal, that the federal government should be giving half a billion dollars to an organization who says that, they're, that, that obviously their core mission is abortion. And the excuse that has always been offered by Democrats and by Planned Parenthood itself is, no, 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 we do so much more than that. We're not just about abortion. We have all these other products and services that we give, and the federal funding, that only gives to the other things that, that have nothing to do with abortion. And so we're primarily a woman's health clinic. Again, using their words, not mine. We're not really all about abortion. That's not what we're doing. But here you have the president, in a moment of apparent accidental honesty, 
saying that, no, the core mission of Planned Parenthood absolutely is expanding abortion. We want more access to abortion. We want more abortions to take place. Our core mission is expanding that for abortion. You got it right out of the horse's mouth. I genuinely do appreciate the honesty. I really do, because I, at least if we're honest, even if she's dead wrong and evil when it comes to this, and I have no problem calling abortion evil. Even when she's dead wrong on this, at least if she's saying that this is the core mission of Planned Parenthood, we can have a logical conversation. Because this hiding behind the veil of saying, no, we're really a woman's health organization and we're not really about abortion is completely disingenuous. They're doing that because it's politically feasible and because they want their precious government money to keep rolling in. And so when you're looking at that, you understand quickly how ridiculous it is. To, it's obvious to anybody that's watching Planned Parenthood at all that this was always their core mission. However, to somebody that has been following the politics of this knows that they've been trying to hide that for a really long time. So for decades, even going back as far as Margaret Sanger, they were denying that their overall mission was abortions. Their website claimed, for example, that abortion was roughly 3% of their business. Now that's absurd because the largest source of income that they have is abortion when you discount the government funding that they give, and it may actually exceed that, I'm really not sure. But the vast majority of their income comes directly from abortions. And yet they claimed that only 3% of their business is actually abortion. And the way that they did that and the way that they skewed the numbers to try to give that false impression, which, by the way, the Washington Post fact checker, even that, a very left-leaning source, gave that claim for Pinocchios. So even they said, no, no, that's a load of crap. Planned Parenthood is not 3% of their business going towards abortion. So the reason that it got these four Pinocchios is they were counting every service as the same. So, for example, if a woman comes into a Planned Parenthood to get an abortion and on her way out grabs some birth control pills and some condoms, then she bought three products. And so they say, oh, well, only 33% of her visit, only one out of the three services that she got was an abortion. Well, yeah, but if one of those services is... 50 times more expensive than the other two combined and far more invasive in an actual medical procedure, then it wouldn't really be fair to say that that was only one third of her visit. I mean, that would be like if you go to a gas station and you buy a hundred dollars worth of gas to fill up your truck and you buy a dollar Coke and a 50 cents bag of peanuts, they say, Oh, well, you know, they only spent 33%. 33% of that visit was gas. No, you wouldn't have even been in the gas station in the first place to buy the Coke and the peanuts had it not been for the gas. And more importantly, the gas cost way more than the Coke and the peanuts. And so to say that only a third of that visit was gas is completely inconsistent, and any logical thinking person will quickly throw that kind of rationale out. So they always talk about women's health when they want to say when somebody says that they wanted to fund them, but when asked and, and talking about it honestly, they'll say, "Yeah, we're really all about abortion." And that's the disingenuous that comes here. So the question is, does this actually make a difference? Is this going to make a change in Congress? Is this going to make a change to Planned Parenthood's funding? I hate to say it, but I'm going to have to say no. Probably not. The odds of that changing anything, even if we still had a Republican House, wouldn't do any good because you'll notice that the Republicans cried and complained and talked about how horrible it was, rightfully so, that we were spending half a billion dollars on Planned Parenthood, which is an abortion mill, back when Obama was in office. But all of a sudden, since Trump took office, we've had several budgets and continuing resolutions brought up. And not a single one has taken a dime away from Planned Parenthood. Well, that's weird. It's almost like the Republicans really don't care. Which is exactly what's going on there. It's a great talking point. It helps them get elected. They know that it's something that is useful for them when they're out on the campaign trail. But when push comes to shove and the Republicans have the power, they're cowards. They back down and they will not even take $500 million away from Planned Parenthood 
that then reallocates those funds and uses it to kill more children. It's absolutely shameful. The Republicans are worthless when it comes to this. And yet, we continue electing them. But on abortion, keep in mind that a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican President funded Planned Parenthood at exactly the same level as a Democrat House, a Democrat Senate, and a Democrat President in Obama's first two years of office. So what's the point of electing them in the first place? And if your elected official brings that to your attention, you take them to task and ask them what they did to try to defund Planned Parenthood. Not, are you opposed to it? What did you do as an elected official to try to get this undone? Because we've got the president of Planned Parenthood out here actually saying that our main goal is abortion. Our primary focus is abortion. And you're doing nothing, nothing to curtail that. What's the point of having you in office? If you can't stick your neck out on this to remove something that isn't even a whole percent of the federal budget and not even necessarily take it away, but just move the funds to somewhere that doesn't do abortions, then you're absolutely spineless and there's no use in electing you. Unfortunately, that's where we find there is no excuse for any Christian ever to support abortion, period. But especially not in the funding of this organization that says that their primary goal and focus is Planned Parenthood. And the Christians that do support that are not living the way that the Bible prescribes. We're going to wrap this up and go to the daily dose of stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. Today's Daily Dose of Stupid, CNN, which has been the topic of quite a few Daily Doses of Stupid, CNN is absolutely shocked and appalled that Mike Pence's wife, Karen Pence, who they refer to as the second lady, is a Christian and actually believes what Christians are supposed to believe. This is the thing that is astounding to them because what they have reported, and, and Huffington Post has also done a story on this that kind of uh, jump-started this whole thing, is that Mrs. Pence has just recently announced that she is going to go back to teaching art to children at a private school, a private uh, Christian school there in the area not far from Washington, D.C. And she's an art teacher by trade, somebody that has done this for a long time. This particular school, because it is a Christian school and a private institution, they make students and faculty take a pledge, an oath, that states that they are going to live by certain principles. And one of the things that is included in this is that all forms of sexuality not consistent with the biblical definition of sexuality is to be denounced and to be avoided. And by that it means the way that the Bible defines sexuality, it only is supposed to take place within the confines of marriage, and it defines that marriage as being a man and a woman. This is what the oath says. This is what Matthew 19 says. This is how Jesus Christ himself defined marriage. And so because of that, CNN is livid that the second lady of the United States would actually take an oath that affirms her own Christian beliefs. I don't understand why this is news or why this is surprising to anybody. If you are a Christian, this is what you're supposed to believe about sexuality in general. And it doesn't just denounce homosexuality, it also denounces adultery, fornication, I mean, any kind of sexual conduct that is outside the biblical definition is banned at the school. And if you are found to be in violation of this code, whether you're faculty, whether you're a student, you can be kicked out. That is true of somebody that's cheating on their wife, but it's also true of somebody that engages in homosexuality. And so because of this, they're saying that this proves that Karen Pence is a bigot that hates gay people, and uh, that just hates gay people and just wants them to die and all these other horrible, nasty things. But here's the thing. First of all, how many vice presidents' wives will pay lip service to children and teachers 
but never actually go out and teach kids. So that's one thing. And I'm not saying that it's wrong for a first lady or a second lady to not do this. I'm just saying that a lot of them give lip service to it and will talk about how great it is. And I think that's usually genuine. Karen Pence is actually out there doing it. Her president is the vice, her, her husband is the vice president of the United States. She does not need to go out and teach kids to make a living. She does it because she wants to and because it's something that she loves to do. So first of all, they're completely ignoring that and, and steamrolling over that. But second of all, one of the articles that CNN put out, and they've put out several, was written by Sirius XM host Clay Crane, who went on CNN to point out that there is a moral hypocrisy here. Now, we're going to dive into this because I, I want to you know, sort through the merits of this. And basically, his point is, how can she subscribe to a creed while her husband works for somebody who's a sexual cad? And let's be honest, Donald Trump's kind of terrible when it comes to women. I mean, this is the guy who broke up with his first wife by uh, because he was already sleeping with his second wife and then broke up with his second wife because he was already sleeping with his third wife. And he's the kind of guy that, that has sex with porn stars and then pays them to keep their mouths shut. This is the kind of guy that he is. When it comes to sexuality, Trump is a pretty awful human being when it comes to that. And so I don't think that he's necessarily altogether wrong when he makes that point. And so to an extent, it is a fair point. But here's the irony in all of this. His suggestion is equally inconsistent because he's saying there is an inconsistency with Karen Pence. And we'll get into the merits of whether that's true in a second. But let's just assume for the moment that his premise is correct. He's saying that there is an inconsistency with Karen Pence for having her husband work for somebody that is pretty garbage when it comes to sexuality and sexual sin, but that she's affirming a code that she will not engage in it as an employee of this school and that the school itself would not allow people that engage in that kind of activity to be students or faculty there. And he's saying that that is inconsistent because she's not coming out and denouncing Trump for the things that he's done. But his suggestion, which is to flip that on its head, to call out President Trump on the horrible things that he has done to women and the way that he has been sexually lewd in his own personal life, but then embrace homosexual children in the school. So his suggestion is equally inconsistent if you're using the Bible as a moral standard. And so you really don't have a case if you're using if you're using that as your standard. Now, if this is a guy that's saying, yeah, homosexuality is a sin, and Karen Pence believes that, so why isn't she calling out President Trump on that? Okay, at least at that point you're being consistent with the standard of the scripture. But he's saying, no, no, ignore what the scripture says about homosexuality and then go after Donald Trump because we don't like him and he's a bad guy. And he politically disagrees with me, ergo the things that he does are wrong. Because you'll also notice that nobody seemed to have a problem with this on the left and in Hollywood. They didn't seem to have a problem with Trump's sexual misconduct when he was just, pres or when he was just Donald Trump before he decided to run for president. But that aside, let's take the point in and on its head. Because he, he drums up this just horrific imagery of the handmaid's tale and this dystopian Christian theocracy that Mike Pence is inevitably going to drive us into if anything happens to Trump and, and Mike Pence takes over as president, which the left seems weirdly incapable of understanding that there are certain things that you believe are immoral, but shouldn't be illegal. And I guess that's because they believe that any incorrect decision that you can make ought to be banned and outlawed. That, if they would disagree with your decision, you shouldn't be allowed to make that decision. I mean, this goes to, for example, Bloomberg with the, you, sh you shouldn't even be allowed to decide how much soda to drink or how much salt to have on your food because you're too stupid to make decisions on your own. So we've got to come in and we as the government have to remove any incorrect decisions that you can make. See, that's the problem with the left in this cent uh, centralized authoritarianism is that they believe you're not smart enough to make your own decisions, and so they have to remove all those bad decisions. And because that is the way that they think, then they believe that anybody that has a strong belief system also thinks that they ought to enforce and force their beliefs on other people. A small government constitutionalist kind of guy 
that like my like Mike Pence is. I mean, he's a small government guy by any standard. Would not necessarily believe that because he finds something deplorable and immoral personally, that it ought to be something that is outlawed or something that is stopped by the government. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and, and I'm just giving the biblical standard here. I think that it is an abomination against God for two men to have sex with one another or two women to have sex with one another. Nonetheless, I do not think that it is my job, nor do I think that God would want a state that goes in and has stormtroopers bust into people's bedrooms and prevent that. Look, as horrible as sinful as it is, and it is, that does not mean that I want the practice itself to be outlawed. And so this is the thing that they don't seem to understand. You can disagree with someone, but you can disagree with something on a moral level and still not want it outlawed. For example, I believe that it is a sin to lie. And yet, because of the First Amendment, I don't want people being prosecuted for saying something that is untrue. And what is so ironic about this whole thing is that the left has this real problem with this private Christian institution saying, we're not going to allow homosexuality to be accepted amongst our students or our faculty, or any other sexual sin for that matter. And yet, these are the people that want public schools to force people to teach the gay agenda. In fact, there have been quite a few cases brought up by people on the left that say that people that homeschool should be forced to teach that homosexuality is a normal practice and something that is good in their homes because they're saying that now that they, those kids are out of the public school system, we can't get to them with our pro-gay pro propaganda, so we've got to go to them and force them to teach this. And so you're saying to a person that wants to educate their own child that they cannot teach anything other than what you approve of, and yet you have a problem with Karen Pence going to a private institution that is not connected to the government and saying, we believe we should hold our students and faculty to a higher sexual standard than the world does. And yet they're the ones that are the crazy authoritarians that are going to take over the country and turn this into a theocracy. You've got to be outside your ever-loving mind to believe that. And one of the things that he, he goes into is that Pence is wrong to work with Trump and not denounce his sexual escapades. Now, to a degree, I do struggle with this a little bit. Not because I think that, because when it comes to Pence, frankly, I think that he could have been a little bit more outspoken when it came to Trump's indiscretions and to denounce them. But again, if you're looking at the biblical standard, and I'm just trying to sort through this because I don't think I have a clear-cut answer. I'm just trying to look at the Bible for similar situations and try to sort this out. You had Joseph, Mordecai, and Daniel that all volunteered to work as the second-in-command for pagan kings. Joseph in Egypt, Mordecai in uh, Persia, Daniel in Babylon. Actually, Daniel for several different administrations in that particular area of the world. But in all of these situations... You had men that were godly, God-fearing men that worked directly under pagans, that did not believe in God all the time, that would espouse God occasionally, but usually held a belief in multiple gods. And so even though they were not Jews, they were not Hebrews, they did not hold God in proper reverence, and I'm guessing when it came on the sexual level, probably pretty promiscuous from the pagan kings of old, yet they still saw it fit to spread God's message and his love by being the second-in-command to pagan kings. So if we're looking at the biblical example, there is some precedent to say that it would be okay for someone who is a strong Christian, like Mike Pence, to serve as the second-in-command to somebody who is very clearly not. And it's just something that I'd, I'd like you to think about. Preferring to work with strong Christians and agreeing to work with non-Christians is not a form of hypocrisy or even inconsistent. Look, as a Christian person, I would really like to work with a bunch of Christians. I would like to work in a Christian organization. But I understand that that's not always capable. I work for a secular institution like Cumulus Media, which I'm fine with, and I love the fact that they give me the ability to profess my faith on a larger scale than I would 
by myself. And they've been very, very good to me on that front. But when it comes to this, I understand the fact that in my job, because it's, it's the job that pays, it puts food on the table and it furthers my career. I have to, at least for this time, work for a company where not everybody's going to be a Christian and not everybody has the same values that I do. I would prefer to work with Christians, just like I'm guessing Karen Pence prefers to work with Christians herself, and that's the reason that she is working with this private institution. But Mike Pence, because he's a politician and works in the government, doesn't have that luxury. And so it's not inconsistent. Mike Pence probably wishes that he was working with Christians that were very strong in their faith all the time. But that's not the reality that he lives in. And so this idea that Mike Pence working for Donald Trump is this massive moral inconsistency No, I mean, if he prefers to work with Christians but finds himself in a situation where he has to work with people that are not Christians, that's not an inconsistency. And so we do need to be aware of that. Speaking of that, let's go ahead and go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today continues our series on the book of Daniel. And just to help you understand and remember where we left off in this story. So the Chaldeans, the magicians that were the advisors to the king, have basically been favored over by people that helped Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are all individuals that were there and got promoted because Daniel helped interpret the king's dream. Now, where is David in this particular episode? We don't really know. He's not really talked about. So we assume he's off somewhere else or whatever. But this is what happens. So they have gone and told the king that even though the king gave the order that every time that you are to hear the music, you're supposed to bow down to this giant golden idol that I've made and worship it. The advisors noticed, or sorry, the, uh, the Chaldeans noticed that his advisors, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to bow down and did not worship when the music played. And so here in Daniel 3, 13 through 15, is the result of that exchange. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, then these men who were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded to them. Oh, I forgot to put my graphic up. Nebuchadnezzar then responded to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? And then they respond in verse 15. Uh, Sorry, in verse 15. Now, if you're ready at the moment, hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and to worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there that can deliver you from my hand? Very good question. And the king, I think, probably is pretty reasonable in his own eyes. Like, he really likes these advisors. He favors them. The reason that they are in the position that they're in is because he trusts them and he thinks that they're pretty good guys. And yet he hears from these other magicians, hey, those advisors that you appointed over us, they're not even bowing down and worshiping like you told them to. And so the king goes over there and talks to these three and says, uh, did this really happen? You have a chance to explain yourself. I'm going to give you a chance to explain why you did this. And by the way, if you go ahead and, and worship this time, this next time that we're going through, we'll just kind of forget that incident of you not worshiping. And I'm giving you a second chance here, even though I said originally that everybody that didn't worship is going to be cast into the furnace. I'm going to give you a second chance. And as long as you bow down and do what I say this time, then it'll all be right. All will be forgiven. So in the king's mind, he's probably being pretty reasonable. He's probably being a lot more merciful towards these guys and showing a lot more favor to them than he would the average person. And so the king does this. But 
you know how the story ends and they decide not to do it. Because here's the thing, this was not a passing fancy for them. This is not something that they just on a whim said, maybe we won't get caught and we just won't have to worship, and so we'll just stand up. No, they knew what was going to happen. They knew they were going to get caught. They knew they were going to be punished. They understood that. And yet, despite that knowledge, these three young men decided, doesn't matter, we're not going to worship another god. The law of Moses says this is wrong. There is one God and one God only, and we are only supposed to worship him. And so when somebody tells us to bow down and worship an idol, we say no. We are not going to do this. This is against God's will. This is against his commandments to us, and we are not going to do it. And so the king shows up and says, oh, you know, they must have misunderstood me, or they didn't think that I was serious. Well, I'm telling you now, if you don't do it this next time, you're going to be cast in the fiery furnace. You're going to be cast in this big blazing furnace. And so you have a second chance to capitulate and sin against your God and worship this idol. And once that happens, all will be forgiven. Now, the human mind has an unfortunate tendency to rationalize its sin. And in this particular case, it would not have been hard for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if they did not have this spiritual strength and fortitude to say, well, you know, we're in a position of power right here, and there are people that are hearing about God for the first time because we're in this position of influence. And so what we're going to do now is, yeah, I mean, we may have to kind of act like we're worshiping and pretending, but we won't really worship, and we'll just do it to go along, to get along, and to stay in the position we're in. And that's what God would really want anyway. Uh Uh-uh. Uh Uh-uh. That is not the way somebody of faith acts. And because they knew that and understood that, they took a stand. A stand that they knew could very well result in their death. But then the king comes back and offers a second time if you do it this time. Don't you know how easy it would be to rationalize it the second time? Because at this point, they know they're going to get caught because the king's going to be paying attention. And they've really already been caught the first time. But he's giving them a second chance to rationalize and say, well, you know, the king is being pretty rational and he's going to let us do this a second time. And they still say no. It is more important to us to follow God's will than it is to stay alive. If we have to pick between preserving our life and not being cast into a furnace to be burned alive and disobeying God, we find the disobeying God to be more objectionable than losing our life by being burned to death. That's how strong their faith was. And they did not rationalize obeying another god or bowing down to an idol. You see, the last part of this is to me the most ironic. Because King Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 15, and you'll notice, what god is there that can deliver you out of my hands? In other words, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't even believe a god can save them. He doesn't believe that their god, which he is aware of, because keep in mind, he's already had Daniel tell him about this god and interpret his dream for him. He's looking at these three guys and says, yeah, just so you know, your god is not going to deliver you from this furnace. No god can save you. I am more powerful than any god you can come up with, and I have the power to throw you in a furnace, and so no god is going to stop me from doing this. And of course, that is ironic because we all know how this story eventually turns out. But the moral in all of this is that real moral conviction, it takes willpower and it takes planning. These young guys made a plan ahead of time. We are not going to disobey our God. And because of that, when they were presented with an opportunity to do so, even though it would have been easier for them to do so from a physical standpoint, They said, nope, it's still wrong. They had this planned ahead of time, and they had the willpower and the strength of mind and of spirit to continue to say no to sin, even when it kept knocking at their door a second time. And that's really what it takes. Sometimes, in fact, usually, sin is not a one-off thing. It keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and giving us more opportunities and more opportunities and more opportunities to rebel against God. But if we're going to be people of faith and we're going to be people that actually do have some conviction and some willpower, in in other words, what God commands of us and what he expects out of us, then we have to have the strength of will and the love for God ourselves to look at that offering and say, 
nope, obeying God is just that important to me. That's the kind of lives that we as Christians are supposed to live. Stay the course, friends.